Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today, we will be talking about zigzag. You know, everybody has a zigzag because everybody has great and wonderful promises from God. But before we can get those great and wonderful promises, we must first go through our zigzag. Abraham's zigzag was the obedience to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Joseph's zigzag was a prison cell, and David's zigzag obviously was zigzag. And if you're willing to accept it, Jesus' zigzag was Calvary. So what is your zigzag? Do not let what seems to be designed to ruin you, destroy you, and you thereby forfeit the dream. You thereby forfeit the promise. Jacob was, Jacob, after losing his favorite son, Joseph, lost Simeon, and then he felt like he was about to lose Benjamin also if he sent him down to Egypt with his brothers to buy grain. He did not realize that by obeying and by going through his zigzag, he would have all of his sons back from the dead, including Joseph. Our message this morning is entitled, Zigzag. So turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. What an amazing statement. What powerful words spoken about David. It says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. It wasn't somebody else's God or some God far off. It was his God. David knew him personally and God knew David personally. Imagine, there's chaos all around him. There are men wailing, there are men crying, there are men weeping, but these were just ordinary men. These were seasoned warriors. Confusion and sorrowing of heart, loud lamentations was charging the air. Everybody was in deep sorrow. And while everyone else was wallowing in their own despair and in their own self-pity, David found strength. Or in other words, he encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. What had happened was, David was anointed king, king of Israel. But there was a problem, a slight problem. There was another anointed king presently reigning over Israel, his kingdom. His name was King Saul, Saul of the tribe of Benjamin. And it wasn't just that, but King Saul was trying to kill David. David was in so much danger that he had to go and live with the enemy whom he was fighting in order for him to have a little safety he had to go and seek it in the enemy's camp. David had thought, he even said, there's only a step between him and death. That's what he told Jonathan, Saul's son. So David went and, and sought refuge in the territory of the Philistines, the enemy of the Israelites. You know it has to be really bad when you seek asylum in the enemy's camp. Well, the king of Philistines gave David and his men the territory of Ziklag. Now, one day the king and his five rulers, the five rulers of the Philistines, had gathered their armies together and they were marching into battle against the Israelites. 
and David and his men went with them to fight. But the five rulers of the Philistines realized that David might be a threat to them. They said, no, no, I don't think so. He ain't going with us. Send him home or this is what will happen. As soon as, as we get in the heat of the battle, he will turn on us and he will slaughter us. It's no way that we're gonna let him go with us. He's a threat. So David and his men were sent home. But before they reached Siglag, their home, they saw smoke rising up in the distance from the same direction that they were heading. Every heart sunk. All the blood in every vein ran cold. And each one in his own heart knew exactly what that smoke and horizon meant. They had done the same thing hundreds of times before to hundreds of settlements. And they never left one person alive to carry back the news to the Philistines, letting them know that it was David and his men who had raided the camp, who had burnt their village, and who was responsible for all of that damage. So they knew what they would, would, um, would find when they got back to their camp. Now that the shoe was on the other foot, and it was their village, their home that was raided, their home that was being burned. It was their families, their wives, their children, their sons, their daughters that was now in peril. And there was nothing that these warriors could do about it. They were completely and totally helpless. I'm sure they kicked their horses into a gallop as a sense of dread, a sense of despair fell heavily upon them. They rushed towards the inevitable, knowing fully well that that smoke rising up in the distance was like their hopes of saving their loved ones was dust in the wind. When they reached Siglag, it was as they expected to find. Everything they owned was gone. Their wives were gone. Their children were gone. Their flocks were gone. Their herds were gone. Their possessions were all gone. Everything that they owned was gone. And what was not taken was burnt up. Their, their home, the place that they called home, was in shambles, lost, burnt to the ground. Now here they were, staring reality dead in the face and it was nothing that either one of them could do nothing that anybody could do no, no matter what the strongest warrior among them the deed was done so they began to weep they began to mourn they began to grieve over the great loss that was before them their lament turned to wails as each man grieved for his family, grieved for his great loss, grieved at his hopelessness. And then the name, the, the, the blame game began. It was not long before fingers began to point and tongues began to accuse and David found himself at the epicenter of it all. In their great mourning, each man began to lash out. It's all your fault, David. You're the one to blame. It was you who led us here to Ziglag in the first place. You were the one who persuaded us to go with the Philistines to fight our own people. If, you, if we hadn't gone, our families would still be alive. If we had only left guards, our families, our children, our wives, our sons, our daughters will still be alive. If only, if only. And they decided amongst themselves, it was fitting a life for a life. And it was David's life that was on the line. David would have to pay the ultimate price. These men were not afraid 
to shed blood. Gallons and gallons of blood were already on their hands. Another ounce or two made no difference to them. They were not squirmish about seeing that red liquid flow. So David found himself in real trouble. His life was in real peril. But David had a promise though. You, O oh David, you will be king over my people Israel. And Samuel anointed him king. But instead of the safety of a palace, David found himself in a strange place, living among strangers, away from his homeland, outside the territory of the sovereign God, the Lord God Almighty. Although we have a promise, a sovereign promise from Almighty God, yet there is no sign of that promise. We feel that way. There's no indication that it will ever come to pass. The promise looks dead. The dream is no longer alive. In fact, it looks like everything is dead and burnt up. We feel like Jacob when he said to his sons in Genesis chapter 42, verse 36. Their father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. Everything is against me. I am sure you can identify with that statement. The boss is riding you while he doesn't even seem to notice the real troublemakers. People are saying all manner of evil about you. They're saying words that hurt you to the core. There's trouble here. There's rubble there. Everywhere you look, there are problems and hostilities coming against you. You know, I heard a story about a witch doctor who was trying to get a Christian girl to slip. His demonic spirits had told him to use anger and wrath against her. So in doing so, he, he, he met her one day on the road and he slapped her. But she did not get upset. So he began to ridicule and, and, and taunt her and, uh, and try, try to get under her skin. But yet, she did not get upset. He even threw urine on her. And still, she did not get upset. She only prayed for him. Because the demonic spirits had told him, if he could get her upset, she would come up from under that protection that she was under and then they could jump on her and he, they could get her to do what it is that he wanted her to do because she would uh, open up a door for them to get in if he could get her angry. So to make a long story short, this girl did not get angry. She did not let him lead her out from under the protection of her God. She only continued to pray for her taunter. Pray for the one who was causing her such misery. And he, he got saved. He's now a pastor. So no matter what comes against us, we must maintain our integrity. It's like Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 through 9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. David had the anointed promise, but he was facing a ziglag. And it looked like he would be stoned to death because everyone was blaming him for the tragedy that they were now experiencing. The dream was over. So while everyone else sunk into despair and into hopelessness, David encouraged himself in the Lord. He remembered that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. 
David remembered the time when the Lord delivered him from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear and delivered him from the hand of the Philistine giant. And he knew that he would deliver him from this situation as well. Praise the Lord. There will be times when your circumstances will bring you down. Maybe you have an exceedingly great promise from the Lord and you will not let anything get in the way of that. Just know that there will be those who will come and judge you by the world's standards. Putting you in a box of the ordinary when clearly you do not belong in the world's box. You live, might live in the world, but you are not of the world. You're of Jesus. Just like those disciples, when the Pharisees saw how they answered and, and, the, and the faith that they had, uh, they, they, they took note that they had been with Jesus. So clearly, you're called to leave your mark, not on this world, which is quickly passing away. You're called for greater things, higher things, eternal things, things that will last forever. What is a name? What's a name in this world that will only last a few years? What is a worldly prize? One that is only lasting for a season. When what is done for God will last forever and ever and ever. Amen. It is not what is done in this world or for this world that will last, but those things that are done for Jesus and for his kingdom that will last. They will say all manner of evil against you. Ignore it. They will plot all sorts of pitfalls for you. Step around it. They will call you all kinds of hurtful names. Give it to Jesus. When life throws you a curveball, don't swing at it. Just let it pass you by and smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. God has something greater for you. God has something more for you. Hold on to that promise. Hold on to that great and exceedingly great promise. It's not something that is starting to already fade. It's something that will last throughout all eternity. God's promises last forever. And what you do for him will last throughout eternity. That means it will never end. It will last and last and last even better than that little bunny. I want you to remind yourself of this, Romans chapter eight, verse 18. For I consider that the, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that, that is to be revealed to us. What a promise. What great things we have to look forward to. Let me read that one more time. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. God has great and mighty things, wonderful things all stored up for us. Those of us who will faithfully do his work. We may not look successful by the world's standards. We may look small and significant to the world. We may even look like losers to them. But know this, we are giants in the kingdom of God. That is where it really counts. That is where it will last forever. When everything else fades, what we have done for Jesus will still stand. So when the world comes against you and tries to steal your joy, when derision flies your way, and even your family is against you, just sing, praise the Lord anyhow. Never, never let old Satan get you down. When life trials come your way, hold your head up high and say, hallelujah anyhow. Do not let the world and the heathens of this world steal your joy. Our joy comes from the Lord and nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can deprive you of that. It is him who defines who you are. It is him who, who causes you to be successful. And if he deems you successful, you are successful no matter what the world says. The real proof of success will be seen when God 
And when Jesus, when they hang up, hand out the rewards, and they say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus is the, is the definer of our success, not the world. So when your zigzag happens, when the hurtful words fly your way, when the relentless persecution is raging and even all the harassment is aimed at you, please know this. It is not you that they're persecuting. It is actually Jesus that they're persecuting. Turn with me so I can prove this. Turn with me to Acts chapter 26, verse 15. And this is Paul speaking, speaking about his experience on the Damascus Road. Acts chapter 26, verse 15. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Paul did not even know who it was that was speaking to him because the voice had accused him of persecuting him. But how could this be? How could this be? I'm not persecuting anyone. I'm not persecuting you. He was only persecuting those heathen Christians who were corrupting Judaism, his religion. But Jesus was under a different opinion. He claimed it was him, it was Paul who was, who was persecuting Jesus. So just remind yourself, it's all about you, Lord Jesus. It's not about me, but it's all about you. I read a story about a missionary woman who was part of the Azusa Street Revival. And she went out preaching and, and, and and she was preaching the apostolic faith and she was having great success. But then the churches and those who didn't believe in the apostolic outpouring, they, they began to ridicule her and they began to, to, to publish all kind of bad stuff, bad press in the newspapers. And, uh, and, and she got so much ridicule and derision and negative comments that she returned home a broken woman. It had gotten to her. And I'm not downplaying the hurt. I'm not downplaying the feeling of brokenheartedness when such ridicules, tears at your soul. It seemed to like tear you apart. But like the old beloved hymn says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Know this, Jesus is our only solace. The only one who truly cares. The only one who gives beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. So, the next time you experience persecution, the next time you experience ridicule, especially if it's connected to your calling, especially if it's connected to the kingdom of God, when thoughtless words carelessly flank at you and hurt your feelings, when mean criticism make you feel small, when things aren't going your way and, and it makes you feel insignificant or things aren't going the way that you want it to go, or things aren't going the way that you envisioned it, remember that God is for you and not against you. You are his treasured possession. He longs to hear, to, to, to gather you under his wings like a chicken, like a hen gathers her chicks. So does he want to gather you and care for you and love you and assure you and encourage you. Jesus loves you. And so do we. Let me ask you, are you a Jesus follower? Are you washed 
in the blood of the Lamb? Would you like to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Here's how you can know Him. Here's how you can take Him as personal Savior. All you got to do is to repeat this prayer and believe it with your heart. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I ask you to lead me along the paths of righteousness. Take me by the hand and sustain me. And Lord, when I'm experiencing all of that trouble, when I'm walking through all of that rubble, when the whole world seems to come against me, I'm feeling down, I'm feeling small, I'm feeling insignificant because of hurtful words. Help me to remember who I am in you and who you have called me to be. And Lord God, help me to remember that my joy comes from you and the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for such a great promise. I accept your free gift of life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now what you need to do is to buy yourself a Bible or take your Bible off the shelf and read it. Read that Bible every day. Study that Bible. Highlight the verses that are meaningful to you. Join a Bible-believing church. One of those who still believe in right and wrong. Who still believes that great things, great promises are promised from God. That still believes that God moves upon His people and that He is still here with us. That He's still the great I Am. That he's still Emmanuel, God with us. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when the Lord comes back, when the Lord Jesus comes back and see you doing what it is you should be doing, he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of your Lord. The Lord bless you, Richie. Thank you so much for joining us Sunday after Sunday. We appreciate you so very much. The Lord bless you richly. May he hear your prayer when you call out to him. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.